Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're here to talk to you today about DreamHost and our story with OpenStack. Um, first, introductions. My name is Jonathan LaCour. I'm the Vice President of Cloud at DreamHost. Been at DreamHost for about five years. Been in the Python community for over 15 years. Um, been a, a, a programmer and engineer for a long time as well. And I'm Justin Lund. I'm the product manager for our cloud services at DreamHost. Uh, my career has always been focused on customers and helping them to use the technology. So let's talk a little bit about DreamHost, just so you can understand who we are. Um, we were founded in 1997 in su Southern California by uh, four college buddies um, just to host people's websites. And we've grown today to be uh, 400,000 customers, uh, over 1.5 million uh, hosted domains and applications. We do managed web hosting, uh, web presence services, and cloud services. And we're here today to talk to you about those cloud services. Uh, and, and we have a pretty global reach. So while we're US-based, and that's where our infrastructure is, over uh, you know, about 25% of our customers come from outside of the United States. So let's introduce Dream Compute. Yeah. So Dream Compute is our OpenStack-powered public cloud. It's, uh, it helps in our goal of helping customers own their digital presence. That's our noble cause that we fight for at Dream Compute, or at Dream Host. Uh, we debuted in beta at the Folsom Summit in San Diego in 2012, uh, but the design started in 2011 um, with some basic design tenants. Uh, we took a slow approach to curate the cloud um, and to ensure its stability. Um, so uh, de uh, debuted in beta in 2012 and moved into general availability in April of this year. Um, so Dream Compute, in a nutshell today, powers everything, like Jonathan said, from simple websites to DreamHost internal services. Most of our new products will debut on top of Dream Compute, which is really great. Um, today, it's super fast. Uh, boots SSH times in less than a minute. So we're, we're very proud of that. It's super speedy. And it's evolved a lot from that 2011 design. Um, we learned a lot from the early days of OpenStack, and we'll share a lot of that with you today. So as Justin mentioned, uh, we kind of debuted Dream Compute in 2012 at the OpenStack Summit in San Diego. And uh, our cloud architect at the time gave a presentation there that had a lot of our core principles and our decisions. And we made some waves about that, which was really fun. And uh, we're going to look at those decisions. And some of them were good. Some of them weren't so good. And revisit and look at all the, the pain points. So let's go back to 2011 and get inside the head of our cloud architects and think, what were we thinking at the time? Um, so first, we had a core principle about storage. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that we could scale up and out and that our performance would be adequate for general purpose use cases, right? We weren't looking to create a high performance computing environment. We wanted to create a general purpose cloud, uh, allow people to um, kind of utilize uh, block storage. Um, we want it to be resilient, right? And resilient to a lot of different types of failure modes. So uh, drives, full nodes, or even whole racks uh, going away. Uh, with minimal customer disruption. We also wanted to be able to do this on top of commodity hardware and software, and we wanted it to be cost effective. Um, at DreamHost, we'd been running um, storage for years and years uh, on our hosting platform, and we'd done it on everything from local storage um, to uh, you know, expensive uh, proprietary NAS environments as well. So we had a lot of storage experience under our, our belt, and we really wanted to do something new that was a little bit more resilient and a lot more cost effective. Um, on the network side, uh, we also, um, you know, if, if you view public cloud or, sorry, web hosting um, as kind of the Wild West, which we do, uh, people kind of signing up randomly and doing all sorts of crazy things, installing whatever application they want, it's, it's very much the Wild West. If, if shared hosting is the Wild West, public cloud is the wild, wild west. Like giant spiders, Will Smith, we're talking like really crazy, right? Um, so we knew we wanted to isolate our tenants as much as possible from each other. Um, and we wanted to do so at L2 if possible. So that meant fancy new virtual networking technologies. And, and um, so that was exciting. And we also knew that the world was going to be running out of IPv4 addresses. And while we are a player in the space, we don't own massive blocks of IP addresses. So we wanted IPv6 support out of the box. We also wanted to support private networks with NAT and floating IPs, 
um, no single points of failure if possible, and we wanted to provide as much bandwidth as possible from every VM to every other VM, no matter where they resided in the cloud, right? Um, so that customers wouldn't really have to care about where their VMs were located, and we wouldn't either. You want to take this one? Sure. Um, so another one of our core principles for the compute side was uh, we thought in 2011 that the world was going to be uh, about concurrency. Uh, lots of parallel cores. The speed of the cores didn't matter. It was all about having as many as possible to apply to as many tasks to get the job done. We thought. We thought. We thought. <laughs> um, or someone thought. Yeah. I don't know if we thought it right. Can we That's cover right. ourselves for that? <laughs> not, not our fault. I'm just kidding. Uh, we wanted the, also, we wanted the operational flexibility to, to move VMs around. Uh, we wanted to be able to do uh, upgrades easily. It should be something that's kind of constant and easy to do and not a big event. Uh, and we also wanted to, uh, to manage hardware failures um, easily because hardware fails. That's, that's something we've learned a lot in the shared hosting world. <laughs> we know disks die. We know hypervisors fail. It's, Computers it's are bad. Software is bad. Yeah. Everything is bad. So that's life. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about how we actually built and designed our beta based on those core tenets. Um, so for the, the storage, we decided to use Ceph. Uh, Ceph was created uh, by Sage Wild, one of the DreamHost co-founders. Um, it has the similar benefits to a traditional NAS vendor. Uh, so it's, it's very reliable, it's very scalable. Um, it's, but it's not a black box. It's not very expensive. It uses commodity hardware, which is very nice. Um, there's no expensive service contracts that go along with, so it's easier on the wallet. Um, the trade-offs were similar also to traditional NAS vendors, where it was speed. But that was okay, because we were looking for general purpose storage speeds of around 100 megabytes per second write times. Um, so that's, that's what we were targeting, and that's what we were able to see. Um, back in 2011, Ceph wasn't very well known yet. Uh, the community hadn't adopted Ceph like it has today in the last few years, um, but we realized the potential and, and we were excited about it. We knew it was going to be a good fit for us. Um, we could use it for both block storage and image storage. Um, ephemeral storage, I think, was questionable at the time. It was, yeah. Um, and it's fault tolerant. We could, lose, um, we could lose hardware like we know we would, and customer data would remain safe. So that was, that was big for us. I'll also add we had some operational experience. We had been building Dream Objects, which is our object storage service, S3 compatible, on top of Ceph as well. So we kind of had a lot of Ceph brains in the house. So we thought, might as well put them to good use, right? Uh, the, the compute architecture, uh, we selected KVM. It's simple, it's free, it's open source, it's built into the Linux kernel. Uh, there's no special modifications to the guest OS required, which is nice. Um, it's pretty easy to monitor. It's scalable and fast without having to make any specific changes to, to be able to scale. Um, it supports live migration, which is important for us. And uh, since it's built into the Linux kernel, it's easy to deploy, it's easy to patch, and we know it runs on commodity hardware. Um, and so we chose some commodity Dell hardware. We chose AMD processors with lots of cores. It kind of fits into what we thought was concurrency, easy for me to say, uh, and, and lo lots of memory, uh, enabling lots of VMs. So uh, that limited our provisioning, over-provisioning on vCPU, but we did not over-provision on memory at all. So we'll talk about uh, where we made a lot of bets was on the network. Um, and this is one of the things we'll learn about a little bit when we address some of the things that we maybe shouldn't have done. Um, <laughs> so one of the big decisions we made was to use white box switching um, with Cumulus Networks uh, Linux on, on those white box switches. At the time when we announced this, Cumulus wasn't even a public, publicly known entity. They were still in stealth. Um, and, and so this one got a lot of jaws dropping in 2012. Um, this has actually been a great uh, and, and wonderful decision that we have made, and we, have, we use it all over the place now. Um, but it was a big deal at the time, and we went with a, a spine and leaf network architecture um, using 10 gig and 40 gig. Um, and we also made a big bet on network virtualization. And that was a very difficult decision to make. 
Um, there were only a couple of ways to do it. None of them were open source. And we went with Nicira before they were acquired by VMware. Um, we were, again, one of the very first customers of them. Um, and we used them for L2 isolation. And then at the time, they didn't even provide L3 at all. Um, so we had to build our own. And that was uh, a project that we ended up creating called Project Astara, which is an OpenStack project. Um, and it essentially created service VMs to act as routers for every single tenant in the environment. Um, and this served us really well. well. We'll talk a little bit later about what we're doing today and, and kind of you know, why we did it, why we maybe should or shouldn't have. Um, but this was the decision we made at the time because it was really the only path forward that would tick all the boxes of our design tenants. So what did we learn? What about mistakes we made? And, yeah, how did we do? How did we do? Let's, let's do our report card on the beta, mind you. Uh, so Ceph was the right choice. I think uh, history showed us that Ceph in the community, Ceph usage in the community skyrocketed. Uh, it's become very popular. Uh, we saw constant improvements in integration with OpenStack and Ceph. So we, we feel like that's been very good. Um, as we knew, hardware fails. Um, and having redundant storage and a fast working live migration, uh, having the storage on Ceph on the network a little bit slower as the trade-off, the being able to live migrate and be resilient to data failures was a big win for us and our customers. Um, one thing is we bet big on storage usage and lost. Uh, we, we created a big storage cluster thinking based on our our hosting customers, they'd store a lot of data. They'd put a bunch of stuff on there. Turns out they were just fine with the amount of storage that, be, that came in the flavors. Um, looking back, it makes sense. But at the time, we thought they would use a lot more storage. Um, and the customers that did want to use storage wanted faster storage. Uh, so that 100 megabyte per second kind of target we were going for wasn't as fast as what people wanted. Right. Um, and while spinning disks are cheap, Having them in step, separate storage nodes is costly. Um, so that was something we learned. Also, one of the unique quirks of Ceph is that it wants raw images to help facilitate, cop, facilitate copy on write, while customers want to use smaller images like QCAL. Uh, so that's been kind of a challenge as well. So let's talk about what we learned on the network side. So good. Like I said, Cumulus has been a fantastic experience for us, as has white box, switch, white box switching. Um, it, it's given us a lot of ability to kind of manage the switches on our network just like any other node in the environment, right? It's, uh, we don't need a, a specialized networking team. Our, our operational engineers, they can handle everything, right? We can use Chef. We can use all the same monitoring tools. Um, we love it. Uh, the architecture itself has been good. The, the only thing we've really done there differently as we've gone forward, which we'll address in a bit, is just to beef it up a little bit. Um, but, but overall, I think our physical network design was, was good. We did well, so A+. Plus. Um, we also bet big on quantum, which is now Neutron. Uh, and I'm saying quantum because at the time, that's what it was. It was still called quantum. And it was really, really early. It was not ready for prime time. Um, we thankfully uh, managed to get one of our engineers to become the PTL for, for Quantum at the time, and he shepherded it through the, the name change to Neutron. Um, and we were able to help move it forward a lot to make it actually start to you know, be ready for our need and our use case. Um, Back then, everybody wanted to use NovaNet. Yeah, was everybody was using Nova Network at the time. There, Quantum there was, was scary. And there were people fighting about this, which was uh, frustrating. Um, <laughs> but uh, needless to say, you know, Quantum now Neutron has made a huge amount of progress. And at this point, everybody's deploying it. Things are working great. Um, but this was not the world we lived in at the time. Uh, and, and having to build our own Layer 3 services, it was very much one of those, how hard could it be, right? It's just a <laughs> VM, no big deal. Uh, turns out it was an enormous amount of effort. Uh, we're very proud of what we created with it. Uh, it's, it's an awesome project. I encourage you, if you have that use case, you need um, to manage service network VMs to do virtualized network services inside a VM. It's a great solution to that problem. Uh, but it did take a lot of effort for us, and we're a very small team. So you know that was not a, a very good thing. Uh, and they also do um, have some downsides, right? Uh, so if you have a service VM, if that service VM goes down, if you don't have an HA pair, it's a single point of failure. Um, and they also require memory, right? So for every tenant, whether they're using a VM or not, you have to actually have a VM ready for them that's the service VM providing the networking services. So that was the downside. Again, these things could all be improved and, and made to work in Astara, but a lot of effort, 
right? Community wasn't really uh, forming as much as we'd like. We also had a lot of issues with the early days of SDN, right? Um, and this is not a criticism of uh, the vendor, okay? To be very clear, uh, it was early. We were trying to do a big, big thing, public cloud, with this very new technology. Uh, and Open vSwitch was not ready. Uh, we had a bunch of nightmares with that. Um, and, but, you know, again, the world has changed. Uh, OVS is much better now. A lot of the, the SDNs out there are much better. Um, but this was a big, difficult, magical thing for us at the time. Uh, if we could go back, not so sure we would have done it this way. Um, also, customers find private networking confusing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the vast majority we found that our customers, they just wanted to plug into the public network. They just wanted a v4 address now, a v6 address now. I don't care about, you know, isolation as much as, you know, maybe we thought they did. And this mm -hmm. is our customers, right? Not all customers, our customers. Um, on compute, uh, what else did we learn? Well, uh, KVM is great, right? This is, we still use it today. Awesome decision. Um, live, live migration is very well supported, and especially with uh, using Ceph for the storage. We can move workloads all over the place whenever we need to. Um, when we have a security issue, for example, and we need to, say, upgrade the kernels of all of our hypervisors, it makes it really convenient to be able to just take a VM, move it around, evacuate the hypervisor without anybody really necessarily needing to know, um, and being able to do upgrades and things like that. So where we have a hardware failure or some other problem, it, it's, it's hugely helpful. Um, and, you know, frankly, KVM's been really stable and has had very few security issues or, or problems in the five, four, four years since we started doing this. Um, the bad side, well, uh, we were wrong about uh, the future. Well, we weren't wrong about the future necessarily. We Not just, uh, we thought it would come sooner. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it turns out, you know what people want? Really fast cores. And they don't care how many, I think two, three, Maybe four, they don't want 16 cores. You know, maybe they do, but they want them all to be really, really fast. So most software, as I mentioned earlier, is terrible. And uh, <laughs> it, it isn't very concurrent at all. It wants one very fast core, and it will, will operate better in that environment. So we got that wrong. Um, and the CPU and RAM mix, we learned a lot from our beta customers, what, what kinds of flavors they wanted. And, and when you start to see the actual usage patterns, it helps you to, to change a little bit. So we'll talk about those adjustments in a moment. Yep. So as we started building our next cluster, we took into account these, these learnings and we made some adjustments, adjustments based on what we learned. Uh, so the first thing we did is we moved the pendulum to the other side and we went hyper-converged. Our storage and hypervisors are all on the same hardware, um, which was great because it reduced our overall CapEx spend. And you take away all the CPU and memory overhead from separate machines running on storage nodes and put them all into one machine. It's much more cost effective. There's one global SKU that we can order. It's easier to provision, easy to order. Um, so that, that part is much, much nicer. Um, but there are some downsides. Uh, it's important to know that your resources for VMs and your storage on the same machine means there could be resource contention there. So you just have to be aware of that and make sure you know how to handle it. Uh, and then we're also looking at, um, during usage spikes, one can almost take out the other. Again, there's ways to kind of manage that. Uh, we've gotten, we're learning a lot about yeah. how to do that new, properly. New learnings for uh, another summit or two, yeah. right? But tunable, Ceph tunables exactly. and, you know, typical type of operational things you have to do to make sure that one process can't own your system, right, if an OSD spikes. Right. Um, but it is, it is a new problem to have. Yep. And your ratios are, are fixed. You know how many CPUs and memory you have and you how much storage you have. And if those start to change with your customer usage, one goes up and you know you have to change the hardware you order because those are kind of fixed. As you add more machines, that, that ratio stays the same. So Good news is we had a bucket of customers who had showed us what those averages were going to be. So now it's, it's been a lot simpler. Right. right, because at the, as long as the averages don't move, they move, we have to adjust, and that's fine, mm -hmm. but yeah. Uh, so like Jonathan mentioned, we still believe the future is concurrent, but today our customers <laughs> are not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, our customers want really fast cores, and Intel provides those. Um, so we, we made that switch, listen to our customers. Uh, having faster cores also makes it easier to over-provision on CPU. Uh, so we do a little bit more over-provisioning, um, but we still don't over-provision on memory. We still think that's the right call there. Um, and even with the over-provisioning, performance is over double of what right. we had before. So 
pretty important. Yep. So uh, let's talk about storage. Um, as we mentioned in our beta cluster, we had separate storage nodes with spinning disks. In our new cluster, our production cluster, um, we have all SSD storage. How is this possible? Well, um, a couple things happened. One, uh, the world evolved and SSDs became more popular and therefore they manufactured more and therefore economies of scale, they got cheaper. Um, still not nearly as cheap as a spinning disk, right? But it, it started to make more sense. Also, when we went converged, we didn't have to buy separate storage nodes. And when you can combine all of that into a single, you know, a single piece of hardware, you get some savings. And so that helped us to pay for that. Um, so what's the good? Well, there's obvious good here, right? Performance is over double again. Um, so we, we've over doubled performance on uh, compute, over doubled it on, net, on uh, storage. We'll get to network in a second. Um, uh, Ceph recovery also is a lot faster. So um, if you aren't familiar with how Ceph works, when, uh, when you lose a drive or a machine or, or you're expanding capacity or contracting, um, data needs to redistribute. And that recovery, when you have spinning disks, is very slow, right? But when you have SSDs, it's really, really fast, especially when all of their machines are connected with 10 gig, 20 gig. Actually, we have dual linked 10 gig out of each hypervisor now. Um, so you end up with 20 gig effective between every node. Um, and that's great, actually. It makes recoveries really fast. But the downside to that is it gets so fast that, again, this resource contention problem can bite you. So you have to be careful. If, you're, if, if you do um, change the, the crush map, effectively, um, change the distribution of the data, uh, the data will, uh, Ceph is a little bit of a control freak, um, a little bit uh, OCD, right? It wants everything to be just so. Right, and so it makes everything happen as quickly as possible. Everything, and when you have everything according to the crush yeah. map has to be so, and yes. it wants to make it that way yeah. as fast as possible. Yeah. It's it's like a it's it's a great roommate, you know. It keeps the whole place clean for you. But sometimes when you have a party, it's just like you won't stop, it's like, dude. <laughs> relax. So that's Seth. That's uh, lots of fun. Um, <laughs> so I'll also talk about um, one quick, if we have time for our uh, a little story. We we did go multi-vendor on our SSD. Um, uh, drives, and that was a really good decision, as it turns out. Um, when we were first uh, going through our, our burn-in process on um, this hardware, everything was looking great. You know, we were you know throwing lots and lots of I/O at it. We were um, you know running different workloads, simulating things. Everything was looking really good. And then we started to run into problems right when we went into you know more customer-facing testing, where SSDs were just getting kicked out. They were just you know the the hypervisor would just say, "Oh, I don't like that disk anymore. You're gone." Right. Um, it was very odd, and we ended up having to get work with our, one of our vendors, the, the SSD manufacturer. They actually sent out an electrical engineer, and they installed voltage regulators on the PCB for the SSD. Like, it's crazy. So um, uh, I'll say that we did have some nightmares on this, but this was still a very good decision for us. Mm -hmm. Performance is awesome, and we have several different SSDs we can choose from now, which is always a good thing, and everything is working great. But it was a little bit of a nightmare. Um, the other adjustment we made was on the network. Uh, in our new production cluster, we're actually no longer using the service VMs. Um, our beta cluster still does. Uh, and we are uh, using distributed routing. Uh, we went more vanilla with Neutron. And, and why do we do that? Well, as I mentioned before, we're a small team. We were spending a lot of cycles, right, trying to do things differently. Um, and we still like a lot about that approach. The problem is we just don't have the time. Right? So we decided to. Uh, try to go in a little bit more lockstep with the community, see if we can contribute to what everyone else was, you know, kind of trying to deploy. And um, so it's good. We, we, less time spent on our homegrown stuff. Um, we're a bit more resilient to failure now because you, you don't lose a service VM taking out a whole tenant. You may lose an agent on a hypervisor and just lose some of the VM's connectivity on that machine, which is much better if you, you know, you're more isolated um, failures. And you know, we're also able to, to get improvements for the community a little bit quicker. More people working on DVR, more people working on vanilla neutron than on uh, what we were using before. Trade-offs, though. Um, th the bad part about distributed things is the fact that they're distributed. Right? Uh, when we had an issue with the network before, we could just go into the service VM and look at the IP tables rules. Really easy. Now, if you have an issue with connectivity between two VMs on two different hypervisors, Oh dear! You Looking have to uh, name spaces on this hypervisor, yeah. figuring out where they all right. are. It's uh, it's a bit of a, a rabbit hole you have to climb down. But it's again, not it's harder. It's different. It's different. It's, it's a different, different discipline. Yep. Um, and we're still some, finding some warts in uh, the Neutron DVR implementation for our particular way that we've deployed it. Mm 
right? Um, you know, some, we are actually using VXLAN, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and there are some, we found a couple bugs, but we're working with the community on fixing those things, so. And I think you were supposed to do that last one, but uh, I'm gonna continue on. Go anyway. for it. Um, <laughs> no speaker notes. Uh, so, yay, no more proprietary SDN. We're really happy about this. Um, this has been a, a great move for us. Uh, VXLAN, at uh, the time we, in 2011, was very early, right? Um, now it's everywhere, right? Every switch you buy, every NIC you buy, well, most of them, have uh, offloading for VXLAN in hardware, right? So it's very, very fast. Um, and we're taking advantage of that, and we worked with our partners at Cumulus. Um, they have some technology they've kind of worked on called LNV, Lightweight Network Virtualization. It's very simple. We're using this bum flooding suite called VXFLD. You can find it on GitHub. Uh, and effectively, what it allows us to do is just using um, uh, Neutron and uh, a couple of agents that, that run in, in, the, in our cloud, uh, we get you know, automatically provisioned uh, VXLAN tunnels for everything. And so all of our L2 is virtualized, and it's all hardware accelerated very fast, very lightweight, no OVS anywhere, which makes me very, very happy. Um, and uh, it, it's very open, no magic. So the downside is, trade-off, not really widely deployed. We're one of the few people using this. I think there are others, which is good. And Cumulus is a great partner in helping us find issues when there are um, issues to, to resolve. Um, but it is definitely not a hugely deployed thing. But it's, it's, uh, it works great for us. And the next uh, learning that we, we made an adjustment for is the public network. Uh, so by default in our new cluster, whenever you spin up a VM, you get a public IPv4 address by default. Uh, that's what customers want. They want, uh, they don't want to fiddle with private networks. They don't want uh, routers for the most part. They want a machine. They want it plugged into the internet. Um, and that's making them happy. Uh, customers using deployment tools, uh, most of these deployment tools now are just looking for launching a VM and expecting a public network. Um, so it's made integration with third party tools a whole lot easier. Um, and so instead of having a lot of customization to make uh, those tools work. It's, it's now just working out of the box. I know Ansible is very, very popular with our customers. As a version two with our new cluster, it just works. Uh, so that's been really great. Yeah, um, absolutely. I've got something in here about other learnings. These are more product-related learnings, I would say. Um, one of the things that we, we try to do is uh, that maintenance is the norm and not the exception. Uh, maintenance should not be a big event. It shouldn't be a customer downtime event. It's just something that's, that's going on. Um, and live migration has been immensely helpful with this as well. Um, customers, a lot of the customers that we're seeing are not ready for cloud yet. Uh, they're really just looking to offload their infrastructure, reduce their CapEx, uh, and move it to OpEx. And they're still looking for 100% availability um, and reliability. So that's what we're seeing. I know that in the past I've heard some of that, and I just I still think that's the case today uh, with a lot of our customers. Um, we've tried several different billing methods. Um, originally, we tried prepaid plans uh, for a set quota. So you pay a small amount, and you would just get a, as much or a set quota, and you could just spin up and down as many machines as you want. That was kind of confusing for customers. They felt like they didn't get what they were paying for. Uh, we tried some pure meter billing, and customers were scared. They didn't know how much their bill was going to be. Uh, so we kind of went with a mixed approach of what we call predictable bill. Um, so now it's you sp spin up a machine, and if it runs for 600 hours, which is the equivalent of 25 days, it's a flat price. So metered up to a flat price, you know what it'll be over the month, which is really nice. Yeah. No matter how many days are on the month, and it kind of rewards you for long-running VMs, which exactly. is mostly typical for uh, right. especially our customer. Like you said, not everyone is you know, ready for cloud. A lot of these applications are not cloud native. They're not using configuration management necessarily. Mm -hmm. They're not. With uh, a hosting background, we have a yeah. lot of customers that are exactly. used to paying you know, yearly or monthly. And we've tried a few different things. But this has worked really well for us, so we're, we're happy about this. Um, and user experience matters a lot. Uh, we've found that we want to avoid information overload. Um, we try to pre-configure everything 
as much as we can, and that's helped a lot. Um, when we launched with Horizon and our beta cluster, customers had to create a network, they had to create a router, they had to allocate floating IPs to be able to assign. Uh, we did a, a quick start type of thing where it automatically created all of that and allocated IPs so a customer could just log in and launch an instance. Having to go through all that process um, was too much. And so we're trying to simplify that as much as possible, and I think customers really appreciate that. Um, and then one of the other things we found is our customers, anyway, find Horizon confusing. There's a lot of ways to shoot yourself in the foot. You can launch an instance without a key and can't log in. You can delete your network and kind of get it into a weird stuck state. Um, so we've been working on a project we're internally calling Sunrise, um, but it's a way to simplify things, make it more uh, focused on servers and not a whole infrastructure platform. Um, so that's kind of something we've And we've got as that well. deployed in preview right now at cloud.dreamhost.com. So if you're a DreamHost customer, you can check it out. Um, making good progress on it, new stuff coming. Um, but, and, and also I'll point out, this is not a criticism of Horizon, right? Horizon's great, uh, it, but it is what it is, right? It's, it's very much a um, Swiss Army knife, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's designed for all of the use cases and uh, master of none, right? Mm -hmm. so, we just need a pair of scissors. <laughs> yeah, exactly, we just yeah. need the scissors. Or the little toothpick. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, so let's bring it all together, and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, so this is what um, things look like in our new Dream Compute uh, deployment. Um, so you can see that we essentially have two top of rack switches. Um, every node in the uh, in every rack is dual um, connected, so uh, one to each tor, and then the tors are connected to each spine, and then the spines are connected to each other. Right? So you end up with uh, very fast networking. Right? Um, the VXLAN overlay, as we mentioned, uh, Cumulus Networks VXFLD, uh, and Neutron just ML2. Um, and all of the NCAP and DCAP is hardware accelerated at the host and in the spines. Um, and you get 20 gig effective between every node in the cloud. Right? So if you have a VM anywhere in the cloud, you can get 20 gig effective to any other VM, um, if, if we give it to you which we don't generally, but we, we can. Uh, and we were using L3 services via OpenStack Astara. Um, as I mentioned, we've moved to DVR now. Just kind of an overview of the storage and compute, the, uh, the converged nodes. Uh, so we're using eight 960 gig SSDs, and then we have the boot um, SSDs in RAID 1. Uh, we're using Intel chips, like we said, Xeon E5 2630s, the 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, our customers love that. They are fast. Um, 192 gigs of RAM in each VM. Roughly about 96 of that is, is used for Ceph, and the remaining are used for VMs. I think I've got that number right off the top yeah. of my head. Um, and then we do get more oversubscription available with those faster cores, but it's still pretty minimal overall and no over-provisioning on memory again. All right, it looks like we actually do have some time for questions, I think. I'm not sure what the time is. Three ended. minutes. Three minutes? Okay, no problem. come up to the mic if you can so that people can hear your question. And then we'll, we'll try to finish on time so that the people after us don't get in trouble like we did at the beginning. Um, and then we'll be over here and can answer more questions. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm not trying to get you in trouble with the time. But, uh, <laughs> you mentioned that when you moved to solid state devices, you actually saw an increase in resource contention, and that seems totally counterintuitive to me. So I'm wondering if you could just kind of yes. speak to that a little more. So um, in Ceph, you have these processes, these OSD processes that run on, on the hardware, right? And their job is effectively to move data around, right? Um, and so if you have like a large spike in IO, right? Or for example, um, let's say we lose a hypervisor and we lose all those OSDs. That means all the data has to move in the cluster because everything has to move around. Um, and what happens is uh, Ceph really wants things to get back to normal as quickly as possible. And if you don't have your tunable set right and you're not careful about how you manage those processes, the fact that, that you have such a massive amount of IOPS that you can drive means that that process can really take up a lot of memory, it can take up a lot of CPU and just go nuts, right? And that's where you get that resource contention because it's co-located with the customer's virtual machines. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. I think it's related to her question. It's uh, aside from the SSDs, what else you guys use to 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 get uh, to get Seth settled down when things 
are not uh, running fine, meaning uh, in order to not uh, uh, punish the VMs running on the right. same node, how do you guys use it? It's a container, how, how do you do it? So, Very smart team. Yeah, we have a great team. <laughs> I think that is the key thing is, you know, Ceph is, is a wonderful piece of technology. It's not magic though. And, and you can't just, it is not, is absolutely not a shrink wrap piece of software, right? It doesn't, it's not like a NAS where you just like drop it in, it's a black box and whatever. You really need to understand the tunables. You need to, um, you know, really have a lot of operational experience before you go to production. Um, because if you do have problems, it can run away from you. And it still runs away from us sometimes. And we have, you know, five, six years under our belts doing this. So uh, having a great team, using the tunables, being involved with the Ceph community, who is fantastic. They're very helpful. Um, and, and for a lot of organizations, the best thing to do is just to pay somebody to help them with that, right? So that, that changes the, the game a little bit, right? Because then you have to pay Red Hat. But um, they're great at what they do. So, you know, worth it for some teams. At some, it's, you know, like those tunables would be like max backfills. You can limit the number of, of backfills that are happening to repopulate all I, that data. Yeah. You can. I also recommend having the creator of Ceph be on your board. Yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. If you can do that, yeah. that's helpful. Unfortunately, help. I can't. But as to, yeah. what you guys are saying <laughs> is that uh, supposedly if a node is not uh, running out of a CPU, if Ceph wants the whole CPU, he, 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 he's going to have it. Or if you can, you know, obviously there's things you can do, right? Managing processes and, you know, setting limits and so on and so forth that, that you can do, right? Um, we haven't done as many of them as we should, um, and we're moving towards that. Uh, but yeah, I'd recommend. Seth can consume it all if you don't yeah. throttle it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have time for, let's see, one more question, and then I will be available over here, I guess. Yeah. Hi. Thanks a lot for your nice presentation. Many of the things you mentioned actually um, are very similar to the experiences we have made at uh, CERN with our cloud. Great. Uh, one bad experience that we have made and that you didn't mention, though, is um, how much memory of the 192 gigabytes that you have on the compute nodes do you actually hand out to the instances? How much do you re reserve? Mm. How do you do this technically? So we have 192 gigs of memory on our cloud nodes. I believe we reserve 64 gigs for Ceph OSD processes. Is that right? I I thought it was more, but I can't remember. I'll yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. Head. And then the 128 is available for, yeah, my team is nodding, okay. for, for customer VMs. Um, that's how we do that. And then we use the standard Nova schedulers, and we configure them so that we make sure we don't over-provision on memory. We, we make lots of extra space. There. But there's actually nothing that you, you reserve for the, for the processes itself, so something that can only be used by the hypervisors, all the services running. You hand out all the memory, is that right? Uh, I actually don't. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I have to ask my team. Okay. Thank Anybody you, everybody. Else has questions? We'll be over here. Thank you.